Joshua, no, First Samuel. My Joshua was a long time ago. We did Joshua, we did Judges, and we did First Samuel. And we're in First Samuel 16. We've got a little more than halfway through. I'm going to back up just a little bit and look what's happening. But uh, David has come into Saul's employ. Yeah, I think we're going to um, just kind of summarize here a little bit. Um, about ending chapter 16 here, we were on 20, verse 20, somewhere in there. Yeah. So we could summarize a little bit um, that the spirit of the Lord has departed Saul and a harmful spirit from the Lord uh, tormented him. And Saul's servants said to him, behold, now a harmful spirit from God's tormenting you. Now, I just want to uh, clarify something we said last night, last week, and I, I think I'm, I'm, this is what I kind of hold to. Um, because the kingdom and the kingship has been taken from Saul doesn't mean that he is lost. Remember that he's not sealed by the Holy Spirit like you and I in the church would be. So my take on this Holy Spirit, um, I mean, the, yeah, the spirit of the Lord being taken and this the evil spirit being torment, tormenting him is for his repentance, for his to call upon the Lord and to rely upon the Lord. There may be some, some sense of this in having David come and soothe him with the harp. And again, we like, like, like last week, I think that what is David playing? You know, I think he's playing spiritual tunes and may even be singing. And that's my take on this. I think that God is, is calling out to him to, to draw near to him and repent. Um, but um, Saul's not having much of that, so. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. Right. <clears throat> David is, is kind of a picture of the gospel, I think, all the way through yeah. the Bible. He's, he's, a, he's the picture of repentance and forgiveness and restoration, yeah. um, in, really, in the Old Testament. I mean, Abraham's a picture of faith, but David's a picture of the one who repented right. yeah, and was restored. Yeah, that's a good point. As we get into David, what is the sense of David? The sense of David is that he's a warrior. He's fighting on God's behalf. He's fighting for righteousness. He's fighting for justice. He has to do some of that in his own life. He has to repent. Um, but he is the type of the Messiah, of course, the type of, of Jesus Christ. Um, but he is fighting on behalf of God and fighting for justice and righteousness and that's the opposite of Saul. Saul is doing uh, his own thing. So, yeah. so Saul sent messenger to Jesse and said, send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. He's still with the sheep. My goodness. That's where, he, that's where uh, Samuel found him. He's still out there. Huh? And Jesse took a donkey laden with bread and a skin of wine and a young goat and sent them by David uh, to his son to Saul. So this is kind of an offering, if you will, almost like the tax or tithe, I would assume, to help David, um, you know, to help feed and, and yeah. take care of David in right. his service. Yeah, right. Yeah. And uh, David came to Saul and entered his service, and Saul loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. Now, when it says that Saul loved him greatly, we're going to see some passion between David and Solomon, I mean, um, um, Jonathan. We're going to see some some affection there um, but remember that that's really not what we, we're talking about here love in God's sight is what you do on behalf of somebody and so in the beginning here Saul is um, loving David he's brought him, into his, brought him into his household as an armor bearer and he's treating him right that's the point this is not going to hold but, but he, he initially um, starts out right here with David so and an important point, because our culture is so twisted, there is a love on many different levels, right? Friendships, parental love, all this kind of love. Our society just likes to twist it all yeah. to uh, a sexual whatever. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, some will even say, make comments about David and Jonathan or whatever. Yeah. You in Christ can love other people. And I think in our culture sometimes there's like real big yeah. barriers between that that is not helpful to the church. Right, that's right. That people sh should and can 
love one another yeah. in a godly way that's got nothing to do yeah. uh, with the, the world that's gone so crazy. And, and I honestly, you know, I've, I've known this, you know, pastors, and, and I've talked about this for years, that it has almost become like a barrier that, that you can't develop those friendships yeah. and those relationships, yeah. um, you know, uh, between people anymore, you know, without... Which I think has damaged masculinity and has caused a lot of the problems. Well, I think it's damaged the church yeah. because yeah. we are yeah. to be yeah. a family showing familial yeah. love to each other, taking care of one another, you know, taking care of the elderly as if they're your parents, taking care of the kids, children as if they were your kids, taking yeah. care of your, uh, you know, those around you as if they were your brother or your sister. Right. Or yeah. And right. Yeah. yeah so there's fi there's five Greek words for love. I think some have, some have suggested a sixth, but. There's five, and um, Eros is not in the LXX yeah. <laughs> with uh, Jonathan and David and, and Saul here, so that's that's not what's going on. So, right. and that needs that doesn't need to be made clear because some have messed it up. And, and love is a hugely important thing all yeah. through yeah. the New Testament yeah. that God's people, uh, His disciples, would be known by their love. Yeah. If they are if a caring, compassion yeah. for each other. You know, there there's several relationships in the scriptures. One comes to mind, Paul and Timothy. I think that was a very interesting relationship. His son, more like a son and father, but very close relationship. Jonathan and David, of course, and some others. And I think uh, they're important. Uh, I think it's important to have good friendships with um, the same gender, um, and it's that, that, that are healthy and they help us make it through. You know, the day. So I think it's important. Yeah. Saul sent to Jesse saying, let David remain in my service for he has found favor in my sight. And whenever the harmful spirit from God was upon Saul, David took the lyre and played it with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the harmful spirit departed from him. And I think that this, this refreshing and well tells us something. Um, of course, the torment is gonna depress him, he's gonna, you know, who else, whatever he's going to feel and sense there. But I think there's a, it, it kind of re, returns him to his normal sense of a person, maybe um, out with a, um, you know, a, a task to either return to God or do what he's tasked to do before God. Um, so I think that's, there's something going on here, but he's going to push back on this, which is uh, the sad thing. So the importance of Christian music uh, all the way through yeah. here. The ancients yeah. understood that music was powerful today. Maybe we, we take it more casually, but the music stirs the heart. It really moves people. Uh, and it can it can set the course of a person's life. People get caught up in, in uh, the rock culture and the music culture, different things can be led down a path, you know? Um, and But good music, worship music is uh, is hugely yeah. important. I just so encourage people. Yeah. There's, there's, there does seem, even in some, in many cultures, there does seem to be a spiritual um, element, element yeah. to dark, dark music and and worship music. You know, we, we mentioned last week. I think Miriam played the tambourines and 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 they did those things. Um, um, but when when they got up and danced in rubber, you know, you know, below Sinai, there it was a bad deal. We, you and I, several weeks ago, we got, we were mentioning, we we're talking about music and. Um, the dark side of, of um, music that come out of some other cultures uh, have ruined or have helped ruin, you know, the United States in a large way. So, so uh, instances, a couple instances of music in the Bible after the uh, Lord's Supper, they what sang a hymn mm -hmm. and then went out to the Mount of Olives, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, both in I think Colossians and Ephesians, it talks about speaking to one another in psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, uh, and how important that is. Um, yeah. you know, all the way through scripture. So I, I do encourage people, I think it's an important yeah. part of the spiritual life. Yeah, I think um, Sunday morning when we're worshiping, you know, when we're singing, I think it's a really good time when the group comes together, when the, when the congregation comes together, singing with one voice and we, we pour our hearts, hearts out to the Lord. He's the audience. And when we do that as one church, I think he's very pleased. Yeah. So Saul was refreshed. Yeah, yeah. And this harmful spirit departed from him. Yeah, so... Uh, um, a possibility here for Saul. We'll see where he takes it. Uh oh, he's rousing him up. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle, and they gathered at Succoth, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Succoth and Azekah. Azekah? 
in Ephes Damim. That's why I gave you that verse. Ephes Damim. <laughs> And Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in the line of battle against the Philistines. When you go on tours to Israel, this is one of the places they take you because it's, it's right near Jerusalem. It's just a, a mile or a couple of miles down the road. Um, and the valley is 100, 150 mile, uh, 50 yards wide. There's hills on both sides. And um, it's going to tell us that um, they stood on either side of this uh, and then down in the valley is still this today to this brook, uh, this brook, and you can go down there and everybody, all the tour groups look for these rounded stones because the brook, you know, rounds them up in the stones. And uh, I see Jeannie back there laughing. That she's uh, so that's why I put these stones up there. Now these uh, these are not from there, but I I put, I've got five stones up there for a reason. They're not from uh, Israel, but it just kind of remind us uh, remind us of this. Now before we get into this battle here, let's talk about the some some elements that we should understand one of the things especially when you're growing up as a child right you always hear the battle of david and goliath right and you know that you're gonna you're gonna fight your fears and you go through life and 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 that element needs to be sustained we need to teach the the children to have faith with the giants in your life and you've heard that over and over and over and we need to sustain that okay and then as we grow up, we need to understand our, our position before God and the giants in our life. Anybody have giants in their life? They're really tall. Um, but, but that's not the first thing that's going on here, is it? The first thing that's going on here is Israel is in, in a battle with the Philistines. And a champion comes out on the Philistine side. That champion, the word there, is a man in between. That's what it means. A man in between. He's standing, the champion, Goliath, is standing in the gap between Israel and the Philistines. Come out and kill me. Who's our man in the gap? And so who's our champion? Who's Israel's champion? It's going to be the messianic type, David. And that's where we always need to start, okay? And, and I think the church has lost a lot of that. I think I wish we would have brought the kids up saying, okay, this is what's going on in Israel and the Philistines, and this is, we need to understand this because this is going to play out in the future, and we would have had a, a well-grounded um, understanding of the Old Testament in a better way, but, but again, there's um, many elements to this that are helpful, so. Uh, so, did we read that? Yep. That's what yep. Get, right, yep. right there, okay. go ahead. Uh, Philistines stood on the mountain on one side. Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with a valley between them. And there came out from the camp of the Philistines a champion named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Uh, usually they give a cubit as like 16 to 18 inches, foot and a half or so. Yeah, it's kind of like the arm. Yeah, yeah. yeah. and depends how long your arm was. But right. yeah, in general, they yeah. kind of stand. So they got the Egyptian effect. cubit, the Akkadian yeah. cubit, and they got the, you know. Yeah. But we're, so we're figuring what, nine foot tall here? Yeah, and, some and, say nine, 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 six. Yeah. 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 So he's pretty tall. Yeah. He's pretty tall. Uh, he had a helmet of bronze on his head, was armed with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was 5,000 shekels of bronze. I don't know how much that is, but it sounds kind of heavy. I can't recall. I might have it written down here. But the point here that the mail is is armor. It's a, it um, wards off uh, the sword and, and that kind of stuff. So um, he's well armored up. He is. It's, and it's interesting, nine foot six, around people who are probably five foot eight or ten. You know, uh, th there are very few six foot. Saul probably was uh, maybe a little bit above six feet, maybe. Um, Maybe that, I mean, that seems uh, realistic there, so. But MacArthur gives 125 pounds. Okay, all right. That in his notes. Okay, that's a lot of weight. Yeah. It's Can not, you imagine? Not overwhelming. Yeah, 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 yeah. A lot of military yeah. guys wear a pack. It's a lot of weight. Yeah. yeah. And he had a bronze armor on his legs and a javelin of bronze slung between his shoulders. This guy is, he's an army on the, on the, of himself. Yeah. He, it's interesting. If you think about this, this is like a tank in the valley. There's a tank, one tank in the valley um, 150 years ago and people are going, wait a minute, what's a tank? <laughs> and it's Goliath in the valley going, this is, this is some monster down here, so. So the shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam. His spearhead was, weighed 600 shekels of iron. They Make give that, that as 25. 
Was it? What is it? How many? He, he, MacArthur gives it uh, 15 pounds. 15, okay. So, you know, like a Heavy eight, things. A eight pound sledge is pretty. Throw a, throw a shot put of 15 pounds. That's amazing. Yeah, you know? that's yeah. pretty, pretty heavy. Yeah. Um, yeah, and his shield bearer went before him. Yeah. So shield bearers are kind of like your partner in battle, right? They're yep. carrying out some extra weaponry. Yeah, he's, weaponry he's hauling some stuff around. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Jonathan had a shield bearer. Right. Uh, Saul's yeah. shield bearer at times, at least, yeah. was David. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so Goliath's got his man out there, too. So he stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel, Why have you come out to drop for battle? Am I not a Philistine, and are you not the servants of Saul? Choose a man for yourself and let him come down to me. And you say, Raymond, why have you gone into your theatrical voice? <laughs> Sounds good. Because it's theatrical. I mean, it's, you know, this is the it's stuff that dramatic. we grew up. It's great stuff. This is great stuff, and it still has to be great stuff. And um, so, and I think, again, going back to the cameras, you know, you get your, God's given you imagination, and we've got this imagination going on. This is, this is terrible. Now, to this day, uh, there's some movies out you can find um, that are fairly decent. And there's a champion out in front, right? Uh, between like the Greeks and uh, um, I'm thinking the Carpath the Greeks and who were they? The uh, Spartans. Yeah. Yeah. So you get the, the champion. If you come out and beat me, you know, my guys will serve you and all this, all this stuff. And that's what they did. It's not myth. That's what uh, they did. Um, so, so it's held out here in the Bible and Goliath is their man in between. So choose a man for yourself. Let him come down to me. Go ahead. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will be your servants. They're, I don't think they're going to do that. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you should be our servants and serve us. Uh, they want to see the fight, but after the fight, they might be making up their own mind. Here yeah, think, yeah. So. Now, where should, should Saul be at this point? Where should he be? He should be in his mail, in his stuff, down there on the valley. Now, God told him that he has a task. Samuel told him, go whip the Philistines. Okay, so, um, so we can talk about our nation. We can talk about the church. We can talk about ourselves. And I kind of mentioned this on Sunday morning. I want to remind us of this. When God has given you a gift and a ministry and a place in life, we need to go forward in that ministry with all the faith that we have. Now, we're going to fall down. We're going to find out that, that David makes mistakes. We're going, to, we're going to get into that. Saul has made mistakes, all that stuff. But is God a God of grace and mercy? If Saul is still alive here, He's able to be, to repent. And I wish that if I was Saul at this point, okay, Lord, take the kingdom, spare my life. I'm going to go, I'm going to go to war for you. And you do, you turn it over to who you want. I, I understand that you want to turn it over to somebody. Okay. I get the point, right? And, and I'm going to war. That's what I wish I would have done. Who knows what, you know, but, but Saul has the wherewithal to go down into this valley and say, okay, Lord, for, for Israel and the Lord, here I am. And, and he's a foot or more taller than, taller than David and probably could have done it with, well, he could have done it with God's help. We know that, but yeah. So, so if he is able to fight with me and kill me, we need God's help and we yeah. will be your yeah. servants. That's right. right. Yeah. Well, the Philistines said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. Well, Let's just go into this a little bit. And I don't want to, you can, I think that you could do a whole study on this, this verse. I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Now, who is Israel? God's, I don't know if you, get, if you watched a week ago when Iran attacked Israel. Overwhelming uh, 300, you know, ballistic missiles and, and drones and stuff. And not one person killed. And I, I believe that the keeper of Zion, keeper of Israel, neither slumbers nor sleeps, right? Um, we can go into the politics of that. We can go into all the nations that helped Israel, uh, what Israel knew beforehand, and the United States knew beforehand. We can go into all that. The point is, 
that Israel protect, um, God protects his people and his, and his land. At some point, we're going to get into when he doesn't do that, okay, because sometimes he doesn't, right? I heard a false prophet today say that the nation, our nation, is heading for darkness and very dark times. And she listed a bunch of stuff. And that, and yet God is going to protect his people and he's going to protect his land. And does he always do that? And by the way, is this his land? Well, the worth is his, right? Um, but the nations are headed for judgment. Um, so my point here is that um, if the, the people are evil and have a problem, God is going to bring them through a judgment, okay? Um, um, but the point here is that this Philistine is standing against the one nation, not the United States, the one nation on the planet that God has set aside for himself, has his name in it, El, Israel, okay? So give me a, a man that we fight together. And so he's, he's challenging, he's not just challenging Israel, he's challenging God. He is challenging God. Yeah. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly Afraid, so we had the fear factor really kind of starting back when Saul um, offered that, you know, yeah. uh, offering instead of waiting for Samuel. Right. The, the people were afraid, and they're starting to leave the army and flee. Um, Saul became afraid and worried about what was going to happen, and uh, made the offer the sacrifice himself. So there's been a fear, um, yeah. a spirit of fear going through uh, the armies of Israel for. Yeah. Yeah. Who who were the only ones that weren't af af afraid? Jonathan and his servant. Remember, and now we're going to find a, a third one that comes out. He's not afraid. So, yeah. uh, we got to remember this too. As we go forward, the church is going to parts of the church are going to not going to understand some of the, some in a, a good church, some in our church, who are not going to understand some things. And we all need to come together and strengthen each other in the Word of God, with the Word of God, not some stuff that we make up that we think is going to happen, some opinion. We need to understand the words of God. And then remember with the Bereans, you know, uh, they searched the scriptures. Remember the men of Essachar, they looked around and they saw uh, what was happening and they understood the times. And that's the people that we need to be. So. so we were talking about this in your office a little bit. There are a lot of Christians today that are getting kind of overwhelmed by the culture. Yeah. Dismayed yeah. and kind of afraid of what uh, could happen or what will happen if they, you know, especially if they speak up and, and really try and take a stand. So we're kind of in that situation now where yeah. I think there's a lot of uh, believers who are just dismayed at what's going on yeah. um, around us, yeah. uh, hoping for the Lord's return. But as you say, it might be a little bit. Yeah. It could be tomorrow, but yeah. it might be a little bit. Well, th think of this concept, and I think it bears well. God says that we're going to, going to heaven, we're going to kingdom. There's a hope, there's a rapture for us who believe in a rapture. Okay, So we have that hope, right? And then things start to change. We see um, things around us. And then we're calling for the Messiah, right? We want the Messiah to come, right? Now, what was the first thing that Jesus told the church, told the Israelites, what we would see in the end times when these things got dark? A false Messiah. Because, see, that's the one thing we want. Uh, many will come in my name and saying, I am the Christ. Don't go out and go see him, okay? Be and why is that going to increase? Because we see the darkness coming, and then people will be itching ears. Hey, I can help you. I got the truth. I got a special knowledge, all these kinds of things. We can't fall into that stuff. We need to see the darkness coming. We need to come together. We need to read the scriptures together, sing together, you know, and, and be prepared for what is coming. Remember what he told Habakkuk. The faith... The just, the just shall live by faith. you got to stay the course, and it could, could be harmful. Think of this, the people in Sudan, you know, the refugee camps and the good that came out of that. But they got kicked out of their land, you know. Uh, so stay the course. You know, it's, and it's easy to say, well, don't be dismayed, you know, and have, have great faith. Yeah. But it's a little bit different when you're, you know, the waves are kind of <laughs> knocking your back and, right. and uh, yeah. you feel like you're 10 feet under. And, and we really need to do clean to the Lord. And we need that spirit. We need that spirit from 
the Lord, that not the evil spirit, you know, yeah, yeah, we right. need the spirit yeah, of yeah. the Lord, right. you know, uh, and really need to, uh, uh, yeah. to have him living in us and shepherding us through this whole thing. Yeah. Cause it, it's overwhelming and I'm very concerned. I see a lot of yeah. believers yeah. kind of caving. And, and okay, so not to belabor this point, but this takes all of us because you may not be dismayed, but somebody else is. Or you may not be dismayed on the day that somebody else is. Or they may not be dismayed on the day that you are. Or the week or the month that you are, right? That you're sick and, and in darkness and all these kinds of things. We need to call each other. We need to lift each other up. We need to keep the doors to the church open. We need to keep all these things going on um, so that we can help each other through the times of our life. Every life. In, the, you know, in this world you have tribulation. But we're going to see a greater tribulation coming. And we need to be uh, prepared for those things. Right. Uh, and we don't encourage each other by encouraging other people in their sin. And, and I, mm -hmm. you know, we see that a, a lot in, in Christianity. It, it might not seem like a lot to a person to kind of cave and say, well, okay, you know, um, you know you're, you're fine. I'm sure God doesn't care if you're gay or straight. And, and just kind of condone it and let them go with it. Yeah. Uh, but you're leading them to disaster. That, that encourages them in their sin. You know, a lot of people... And, and there's a lot of people in the church who battle with these issues. Yeah. And when um, people start caving and saying, well, it's okay, then their temptation just increases. Yeah. Well, maybe this was okay. You know, maybe yeah. I should go that direction. Yeah. Uh, as believers, we encourage people that God has a better way. He is the way, the truth, and the life. And yeah. he's got a better way to live than for, to live in sin or to turn yeah. away from God or to give yeah. in to these things. God has a better way, yeah. um, it, you know, and, and so when we encourage people, you've got to encourage them in the truth and that there is a better way of living faithfully for God yeah. um, than there is caving into the world. And so you may not play the liar. You may not have a good voice and be able to sing, but you have a liar, right? We all with, have with a the tune. Y, not, not the one with the I. Yeah, we, have, the, a, we, we have, have a guitar. Tune. We have a tune in our life that we play, yeah. if, per se. We have something that we can do for somebody. And that we need to continue that in the church in particular. Yeah. Encouraging people in yeah. the faith, not the faith. out of the faith. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Let me help you out of the faith. Yeah. Yeah. Now, David was the son of an Ephrathite in Bethlehem in Judah named Jesse, who had eight sons. In the days of Saul, the man was already old and advanced in years. Now, Jesse gets repeated over and over in here. Yeah. Although there's not a lot said about him yeah. other than he has these sons. And he, he yeah. does appear, of course, in the lineages lineage, yeah. and things. Yeah. You just got to wonder about this guy. His name just keeps coming up over and yeah, over and right. over again. Remember when, we, David. remember when we went through Ruth and I showed you, um, and then in Genesis, where it showed um, the name of Jesse, and it showed those names. They are in there. I, I looked at those things. They are there. And, and that's coming out here. I think you're right. Look at, look at this. They, this is pointed. He wants to make a point here that David was the son of an Ephrathite. That's a clan. That's a clan of the town of Bethlehem in Judah, which is a what? The tribe. Okay. Where does Jesus come from? <laughs> okay. This is the point that we need to establish. Again, going back to the Goliath, we can beat the Goliaths and the giants of our life. But we need to establish who David is. And the promise goes back to Abraham, this specific promise. And it follows through to the Old Testament, into Jesus, where was Jesus born, and, and all those kinds of things. So that's being established here right now. So and it does establish that Jesse was already old and advanced in years. When, uh, and there's kind of a, a picture there. When Israel, when the time is right, the Messiah will come. And this man is old and advanced in years. I can't help but thinking of of, uh, you know, when Jesus went to the temple and you had Anna and Simeon and yeah, those right, who had right, been right. waiting for him. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are so many messianic connections yeah. in these yeah. things. It looks like there's a there's a, a convergence thing happening here. And I just, I need to point this out because I like the, I like convergence. I like watching convergence happen. God's, you know why? Because it's God's appointments, right? God's, God's intersections. Uh, Saul, is, Saul is old. Time for somebody else. Samuel was old, time for him to go. There's a, there, was a, there was a change, okay, bring the king. The priest and the judge, bring the king. Now, bring the messianic type, David. So there's a, there's a, there's a um, 
convergence going on here. I think. He's also the eighth son. Didn't you talk about there being a number of like a new beginning? Yeah, right. Or it fits yeah. in pretty well here. Yeah, I think so. Uh -huh. All right. The three oldest sons of Jesse had followed Saul to the battle. The names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, next to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. The three eldest followed Saul. They're not going to be all that nice to him. Of course, he is a little brother. So they're pointing this out again. David was the youngest, and we're going to see how this plays out. It's so fun, the, the brothers picking on this guy, just like, remember Joseph and Jesus. So. Um, but the point here is the three oldest that were not anointed were also not effective yeah. in right. this battle. Yeah, right. All right. David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. For 40 days, 40 days, the Philistines came forward and took his stand morning and evening. That's really interesting to me. 40 days is actually kind of quite a while to be camped there and uh, doing this. You assume that during those 40 days, they're trying to send out fielders to see what the uh, Israeli army is like to um, kind of do a little reconnaissance here. Uh, they're probably not just sitting there not doing anything. And I think they're kind of sensing that a lot of Saul's people are fading yeah. away from yeah. the camp. Now, David is going back and forth for how many days? So I, I, I don't know if we can get into everything that's trying to be said here. Maybe and I can make too much of it because I tend to do that sometimes. I like to say, watch for these kinds of things. Um, but something's happening for 40 days here. And it's not just with the, 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 the Goliath. And it's not just with the Philistines. It's with Israel and it's with David. And David is doing something for 40 days here. He's watching this and um, things are being, I think, uh, laid up here. It's a, it's a pattern. It is a, a pattern. An Old Testament pattern. I don't think the Bible throws things like this in there without reason for There's it. There's no way. So 40 is, is a testing time, a time of trial, a time of preparation. Yeah. Sometimes for people. And so yeah. David's kind of going through his 40 days. Of course, the Lord goes through his 40 days in the wilderness. Um, Moses on Sinai. Yeah. 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 So the Philistine comes forward, takes his stand morning and evening. And Jesse said to David, his son, take for your brothers an ephah of his, this parched grain and these ten loaves and carry them quickly to uh, the camp to your brothers. So he's a servant. He, uh, he's not going to do the sheep anymore because we need him to do something else. So he's just going to he's going to grab stuff and take it to his brother. So and I do notice here God's warning. Saul isn't paying his soldiers necessarily. Yeah. Their families are yeah. providing their food, their yeah. clothes, the things that they need so yeah. they can go to war yeah. for him, which is one of the things God said, you know, he's going to take your sons, he's going to take your daughters, yeah, he's going right. to take the best of your stuff. That's right. Yeah. So, yeah. Uh, let's see, something here, something here too now. This is, I think that we need to really take this one to heart. Um, can you deliver this loaf of bread to whoever? And then what's, what, God, what is God going to do here? What is David going to end up doing? Jesse is doing, he's playing for a guy who's going to hate him. He's playing for a guy who's turned against his own nation and his own God. Okay. He's, he's serving, he's coming in, doing his, those things. He's being picked on by his brothers and even his dad to some extent. Those poor sheep, those, those lowly sheep, we're going to see that more and more. And, and then Jesse says, you know, take this. You know, and be a, you know, um, an Uber. <laughs> and, but God, at some point, takes him and says, okay, enough, enough of that. We're, uh, it's time to get busy here. So, yeah. yeah. So Keep ten, ten cheeses. I wonder how big they were. They're going to the commander of their thousands. <laughs> yeah. I've, seen, I've yeah. seen some pretty big ones. You know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Big yeah, cheese yeah. wheels here. Uh, do you think one of them would have fed 100? Uh, yeah. I don't know. Maybe they're just for the commander. See if your brothers are well. Bring some token from them. Their father wants to know that they're well. Yeah. <clears throat> so Saul and they and all the men of Israel were in the valley of Elah fighting with the Philistines. And David rose early in the morning and left the sheep with the keeper. Okay? He left the sheep. Now, these are points that we need to understand. He is leaving the sheep behind. That's a point that, he, that, that the writer wants to make, God wants to make. He left them with a keeper. 
He took the provisions and went as Jesse had commanded him. And so he's giving up his life. He's giving up his peace. And he's doing the mundane thing that God is giving him to do. And he came to the encampment as the host was going out to battle line, shouting the war cry. He's going about his business, having to leave the sheep and doing these mundane things. And then the convergent thing happens where he comes um, when the encampment at the host was going out to battle line, uh, shouting the war cry. And Israel and the Philistines drew up for battle against, army against army. And David left the things in charge of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. Another really important point. A couple things here. One, I want to remember where Saul was hiding when they first called him. He was hiding in the baggage. It's the same exact Hebrew word. David comes and leaves the key things with the baggage. And what does he do? He doesn't walk. He runs. He runs to the ranks and went and greeted his brothers. Now, if you've got your film going, if you don't have any background on David, you would think David just, the, the brothers are going to accuse him of this. You just want to see what's going on. You just want to be a part of this. But when we find out who David is and what's going on, we understand that David's heart is in this matter. And he's doing what he sees God needs him to do. And folks, that's, that's you and me. That we get a desire. God gives you a gift. You get a desire to perform that gift. We keep our... David's keeping his mouth shut. How good am I? What am I... You know, he's not doing that. He's just doing... He's just going about his stuff. And God will recognize him for it. Remember, it says specifically that God does, has not um, forgotten your work on his behalf, Paul says. So we go about our work and carry out, and then God has these things for us. Conversions. So um, the way that this uh, is pictured is the battle lines are drawn up, and these men are in the ranks, and David's running out to, to talk to them. So these guys are like drawn up you know, yeah. in their battle formation. To the ranks. To in the ranks. And uh, Davis come out there and greeting him. I can kind of understand where they're a little bit yeah. saying, hey, "Yeah, it's going to look odd. Yeah. He's going he's to be a fish out of water here, that's yeah. for sure." Yeah. As he talked with them, behold, the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, came up out of the ranks of the Philistines. Spoke the same words as before. David heard him. David heard him. At this point, there's the conversion thing again. David heard him this time. David heard yeah. him. And, and David was where he was called to be. He yeah. was where God had yeah, that's right. you know, prepped all this for him. So. Yeah, that's right. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled for him, from him and were much afraid. So the ranks must have drawn back as he came forward. And, uh, and the men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? Surely he has come up to defy Israel. There's the word again. And the king will enrich the man who kills him with great riches and will give him his daughter and make his father's house free in Israel. Now, I understand this, okay? This is how they did things in the old, you know, the old west. Yeah. <laughs> this is, oh, we're gonna, we'll, we'll pay you a bounty to go take this bad guy out. You know, that's the kind of stuff that, that happened. If you weren't the champion, you paid somebody to go do your dirty work. And that's what is happening here. Um, and so, you know, that's uh, the normal thing I think is happening. So the king <laughs> yeah, is not yeah. going out, and you just see the yeah. spirit of fear. He's looking for yeah. somebody, yeah. Um, for somebody who can do this, yeah. someone who can match him. Yeah. So you just—I don't—I see the spirit of fear just at work in all this. That's things. right. Yeah. David said to the men who stood by him, "What shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? Takes away the reproach from Israel. Yeah. For who is this uncircumcised Philistine?" that he should defy the armies of the living God. When uh, these days you talk about it as an un, that word uncircumcised is kind of like an unbelieving. Yeah. This idea of, of someone who has no regard for God. Yeah. Now at this point, this is our, these are the first words of David. And, and something comes out of this, you go, okay, what is, what is happening here? Because what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? And so the question is, is he talking from God about God's on God's behalf or is he talking about 
what, the, what is the king going to give me? What is all this going to... We, we honestly really um, don't know. But he's talking about taking the reproach from Israel. And that is a God matter. The, we know this because he's talking about this uncircumcised Philistine. He puts Goliath in his, in his place. In other words, the, un, the word there, uncircumcised, you can just basically correlate it, uh, correlate it to he's unconsecrated, he's unholy, he's unclean. He is uh, a pagan Gentile. And so, so David is setting himself in a holy place. And I just have to say this. We can go, okay, David, you know, what are you looking for? Some kind of reward here? And he says, you know, I, know I am. And I'll tell you, I say it this way. In the book of Hebrews, it says, you must believe that God is, and then he rewards those who seek him. Another thing is that David has lived with God wherever, wherever he's been and whatever he's done, and he has rewarded him. And so I simply believe that he's stepping into the holy place and saying, okay, let's see what God's going to do in this place. Uh, that's my take. It, and this is really foreshadowing, right? Because, you know, all his brothers are saying, oh, he's going to get, you know, wealth and he's going to get married into the king's line and all this. But we know, yeah. we know it's going to happen to the guy who kills this Philistine, right? right. He's going to be yeah. hunted. He's going to be exiled. Yeah. He is going to be, um, Saul's going to try and kill him. It's like, wait a minute. Yeah. I thought he was supposed to be rewarded. But instead, yeah. as it goes through this, what shall be done for the man who kills this Philistine is an interesting question. Yeah. We kind of know how it's yeah, going to right. work out. Right. And uh, it is not the promise. Um, That's right. That's we're we're going to take this up next week. But but look at where this ends here. And so so think about this. Who will who, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the approach of Israel that he, this uncircumcised, filthy man, defies the armies of the living God? See the problem? See the big... See how, how big David made it? And that's honestly where we're at. And we want to pick up on this next week. It's a, it's a, I think it's a big deal. So, it is. Yeah. Go ahead and pray. All right. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word. We just ask you, Lord, for your blessing on each one who's come out. And strengthen our hearts and hands, Lord, for it's left this week. Give us a heart, uh, Lord, for the lost, those around us, always pointing to folks to Christ, understanding that, Lord, the armies of the Lord, the Spirit of God is greater Yes. than anything in this world in Christ's name. Amen. amen. All right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you.